All right. <clears throat> How many know the church I see is the authentic church? This is part 10. We're not going to do part 11. If you had been in our planning meeting, you would have heard all the jokes about, but wait, there's one more. <laughs> this is it. Yes, I'm positive. But part of being an authentic church is being transparent and being real. And the truth is, <clears throat> we've been talking about this, churches prosper when everyone is involved. And we want everyone to have an opportunity to get involved. In fact, it's kind of the expectation. What do you mean? You have an expectation of me? Absolutely, I do. And if you don't communicate your ex expectations in relationship, what is that called? Assumption. Assumption is not a very high form of communication. So let's communicate expectations. Biblically, from 1 Corinthians 12, I can make a pretty strong case that each of us is a member of the body of Christ. And within that, each of us is a necessary part. Can everyone say necessary part? Necessary. That means God has a place for you within the local body of believers. Even you, Joe. God has a place for everyone within the body of believers. And that means that each of us is a necessary part. So the expectation is that everyone does their part. We have many opportunities for people to get involved with us. And if you're wondering what some of those are, come talk to us sometime. I'll point you in lots of directions. I see SC back there. Wave it over to SC. Steve. Wave at everybody. He does a great job back there on the, on the audio mixing, right? But he can't possibly, yeah, you can give him a hand. He does a great job. <clears throat> but he cannot possibly be here every time the door's open. How many know this is true? So, so we, we, we could always use people that have a little bit of an ear for music to be trained so that they could stand back there like SC and do a great job like him. People become the most passionate about things with which they're the most involved. That's Kerry Newoff. And he has a leadership blog, and he's rapidly becoming like the next John Maxwell in leadership training. The guy's doing a great job. But see, when we are involved in something, we are more engaged in it. I was telling them at first service, I have a fantasy football team. I'm in third to last place. I guess I'm not quite as engaged in fantasy football as I am building the kingdom. Do <laughs> you see how that works? You see, what do we give our time, our talent, and our treasure to, as we've talked about over the last 10 weeks, little by little? And the other thing that I want to talk about foundationally, uh, before I ask my wife to come forward, Jesus, when he was here on planet Earth, he made many truth claims. Many. He made a truth claim that he had the power to forgive sins in Mark chapter 2. I'll prove to you the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. He turned to the paralyzed man and said, what? Take up your mat and walk. How many know that only God can really forgive sin? Amen. Only God really has that right to, to pardon a man's sin. Jesus had authority on earth to forgive sins. That's a truth claim he made. That puts him equal to God. He made another one in Matthew 12 about the sign of Jonah. Three days and three nights I'll be in the belly of the earth. In other words, I'm going to raise up again from the dead position that I'm going to find myself in. Now how many of you can raise yourself from the dead? Come on, you come up and prophesy that you're going to be dead for three days and then you're going to come back to life. Jesus did that. Amen. There's some power in that. But here's the greatest truth claim he made, John 14, 6. Let's put that up on the screen for everyone. Jesus told him, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one can come to the Father except through me. That's a pretty powerful truth claim. In fact, if Jesus is correct in that statement, then every other belief system or world religion is wrong. 
So either Jesus was wrong or someone else is wrong. Everyone else is wrong. When he said, I am the way, I am the path, there's only one road to get to heaven. When he said, I am the truth, I want to talk about the truth for a second. I think it was vines from Aletheia in the Greek. The reality lying at the basis of an appearance, the manifested, veritable essence of a matter, not merely ethical truth, but truth in all its fullness and scope, or essentially, Jesus is the substantial foundation for all reality. He is the beginning. He is the beginning. He will be the end. Your life was breathed into existence when God said, and his breath went into you, and your spirit was created, and you became a human. Right at conception. Truth is, Jesus is God. He is the only way to get to heaven. He goes on and talks about the Zoe life or the life that God, the kind of life that God gives. But see, that's a truth claim that he made. But foundational to all of our belief system is the truth. And if the Bible really is the word of God, and if Jesus really is God, then that means that even under some Christian umbrellas, they're believing in, they're, they're bringing a mixture saying, well, there's many roads that lead to God. That's not what my Bible says. No. No. So we either stand on the truth of God's word or are we going to have some problems? And in your life, if you haven't established a solid foundation on the truth from God's word for your life, you're going to struggle. But the truth claims that Jesus may differentiate Christianity from every other world religion and every other belief system that there was. We all need to be involved. Jesus made some truth claims. That's all I have to say for now. I'd like to invite my wife up, and she's got lots to say for you. <laughs> Actually, I think you're really going to enjoy this. So good morning, everybody. The truth. So Pastor RJ was just explaining to us a little bit of what the truth is. And I love this quote by Lisa Bevere. It's, it's just such a profound quote, and it has so much in it. Um, and she says, the truth without love is harsh, but love without the truth is a lie. See, my greatest prayer over just pressing in and just hearing the Holy Spirit and what he wanted to, he wanted to say to you today was that the message would just be wrapped up. The truth would just be wrapped up in so much love. Layers and layers and layers of love so that the truth would be able to pierce your heart, but you just wouldn't really know that he was bringing such correction into your life because it was wrapped up in so much love. And <laughs> authentic church means not false, copied. We are genuine and real. Having an origin supported by an unquestionable evidence authenticated and verified. So this church, our church, the Church of Jesus Christ, we have an origin supported by unquestionable evidence and authenticated and verified. And the authentic church means that it's filled with people who are real, genuine with each other, who have to walk out life step by step, Every day, each day, with each other. And to be authentic, real, we have to be willing to be vulnerable with each other. But you know what that means? That means that we have to be willing to take a risk. 
and put ourselves out there. But it might sound like the easiest piece of advice when somebody says to you, just be yourself. Just, just be yourself. When in actuality, truly, honestly, it's really difficult to just be yourself and put yourself out there. Because you have to take a risk. It's personal yourself, you know, personal. So when you're taking a risk and putting yourself out there, that means that you're giving somebody permission to judge you or criticize you, accept accept you or reject you. And then that puts you in a place of real vulnerability. And we're asking you, Pastor RJ and I, to be those kinds of people because that's what draws people to us is that we're real. We're willing to be real. We're willing to share heart to heart and that we're a safe place. But we can't, I really felt like we can't ask that of you unless we're willing to go there before you and be with you and set the example because that's what Jesus did for us. And I really felt that in, the, the deliver, in giving this message that the Holy Spirit really, really impressed upon me that he wanted me to share something that is very personal for me. It's very difficult for me to share in that I'm taking a risk and putting myself out there. And it's very, it's very hard for me to do this. So, um, so Pastor RJ and I, we have, coming up to this point in our lives, led very different lives uh, before we met each other. I did not grow up in an evangelical Pentecostal church. Pastor RJ has. Um, we didn't even know each other until we met one day 19 years ago. And um, my experiences, all our experiences have shaped our lives. Some good, some bad. Some shaped us. Some good experience, bad experience. They all shape us. They work together. They some build up walls and some open us up. I had a very personal, very personal encounter with the Holy Spirit, with Jesus a few years ago. And if it were not for that encounter that I had with the Lord, I wouldn't be able to stand up here today because I wouldn't have opened myself up to what the Lord had wanted me to do had I not had this encounter with Jesus. But he's so good. He's so awesome. He's so personal. He knows just how to work with me. See, growing up as a child, okay, let me go back. See, when I first got saved, I was 24. And I had become a Christian. And I didn't really know what this whole thing meant. Learning all the Christian words and everything and all of that. Um, and when I would hear preachers and so many uh, awesome men and women of God talk and say, you know, God wants to use you and he wants to use you with people and he wants to use your life and he wants to use your gifts and your talents and all of these things. I... For, for a few years, I did not, I, I didn't know, that bothered me. I didn't know what was wrong with me. That bothered me. That word, see the point I'm trying to get across to you today is there's a difference between using and serving. Amen. And I did not understand why that kept bothering me. That just grated on me. I couldn't, that word used just, oh. And it set a wall up between God and I. That father wound is very deep. See, for me, when I was a child, um, my father was very sick with schizophrenia. I don't remember, my father, my mother tells me that he became sick when I was two, and I don't remember any other man but my dad when he was very ill. And he refused to take medication. He refused to get any help. And so he had suffered from schizophrenia, and there were many personalities that he had, and unfortunately, some of those personalities, I suffered some abuse for many years. And that abuse caused me to build up a wall. Because the only time my father ever paid attention to me was for his own benefit and for his own gain and to benefit him. And it was not voluntary. It was out with, without volition and I was being taken advantage of. So 
when Jesus is coming to me saying, I want to use you and I want to use your life and I want to use your gifts and I want to use your talents. Well, that doesn't sound real good to me. But I didn't know what the problem was. So I had this incredible encounter with the Lord. See, when I talk to God, I like to talk to him out loud because, see, I'm able to work out my thoughts. So if you ever hear me talking out loud and there's nobody around, I'm really talking to Jesus, okay? So <laughs> I, I, I'm, I'm able to focus my thoughts better when I'm talking out loud. And I'm working it out with the Lord. And when I'm working it out with God, his voice is able to just sit and come into my heart because there's nothing else going on inside because everything I'm thinking, I'm saying. So I was talking to him. Finally, I got smart and I went to God and I said, what is this deal here? What's going on? And uh, he said, Mary, you need to say it out loud. Why? What's wrong? And I just told the Lord, I said, Jesus, I don't want you to use me. I don't want to be used. I don't know if that's wrong, but I don't want to be used. And he said to me, it was felt like God brought such truth and correction into my life that I didn't know. It felt he spoke such acceptance and such love and such worth and such value in the mo in that moment at the same time speaking such revelatory truth into my life that it shifted my whole world. And that's kind of like what I'm praying and believing for that the Lord is going to do for you today. Because I know that the, the devil has told me and said, me, if you share this, you're a freak. Nobody else feels the way you do. And if you do, they're going to judge you and they're going to think you're crazy. Who the heck does she think she is? But God says, Mary, if you share this, I promise you, I'm going to work in you and through you to bring freedom to other people because you're not the only one. You're not the only one who feels this way and they need to know, they need to understand. So Jesus, in that moment, I was sitting on my bedroom floor and I'm crying out to the Lord and I'm sitting on my bedroom floor and I'm saying to the Lord, Lord, I don't want you to use me. I've been used and abused and I don't want to be used anymore. And Jesus said to me, it was like he took my face and he looked me in the eye. I've never felt such vulnerability yet, such a piercing in my heart yet. All of a sudden, this love that just melted my heart all in a moment. When he felt like he was looking at me in the eyes and he was saying, Mary, I don't want to use you. Your king has come to serve you. And in that moment, everything just broke. That lie was just broken. And Jesus said to me, your king has come so that he might serve you. Not that so he can use you, but that so you, he can serve you. He came to die on the cross, to set us free, to give us liberty, to give us hope, to give us freedom. He came to serve us. And he says, I can't take from you what you won't give. Because that's what serving means. You give it to him. See, the next thing that the Lord had asked me was, are you willing to serve me? Your king comes before you. Will you serve me? The king who came to serve you first. I made that decision that day. To serve the king. Who served me. And everything broke in that moment. And no longer was God using me. But I was serving him. And in that mo and later on, I wanted to share this, that later on, my father has passed away a little over a year now. But just before I died, or 
my father died before he passed away. God granted me a precious moment with my father a couple weeks before he died. A very private moment with him in his right mind. And he spoke into me for the first time that he loved me and that he asking for my forgiveness and that he was so sorry for what he had done. And he accepted the Lord. And he's with Jesus now. And I will get to have many talks with him, but I was able to forgive my father. God gave me such a heart for my dad. I can't even explain it. It's just a miracle of God that he gave me such a heart to my dad. Um, to forgive him willingly and release it that because Jesus wasn't using me and wasn't setting me up to be used and abused. He was serving me and I'm choosing to serve him. So in this church, Pastor RJ and I, he's asking you and saying to you, this church thrives when everyone contributes. It's not just your contribution we're after. It's your heart. It's will you serve because we can't take from you what you aren't willing to give. We don't. And if you've ever, from my heart and Pastor RJ's heart, if you've ever felt like all the church wants from you is to use you and abuse you and use your time, your gifts, your talents, that's not what we want. But truly, I say to you, we can't do this without you. <laughs> we can't. We need you to willingly give your service to us. So that together, in unity as the body of Christ, we can serve. We can serve each other. Because the word of God says that we serve each other. I got to get the Bible in here somehow. So, Luke, or we already read Luke 9, 21 to 27 today as our key verse. I want to talk about Matthew 10, 38 and 39. And Jesus says this. He says, if you refuse to take up your cross and follow me, you are not worthy of being mine. Jesus says this. He said, if you're not worthy to take up your cross, you're not worthy of being mine. <sighs> Vanessa, would you come? Vanessa is going to help me illustrate a point. I hope that we can frame it for you. So Vanessa is my godly representative. She's Jesus. She's God. Isn't she beautiful? See, your cross is a very personal thing. It's personal. Nothing about you is generic. Nothing. You have been called. You've been designed. You've been created by a God who thought of you, formed you, wrote the whole book about you and said, will you fulfill the purpose that I have for you? Not the one that you want, but the one that I have for you. See, you know why there's depression, anxiety, unfulfillment, and all kinds of um, just self uh, depression and oppression and everything in this world is because of competition and comparison. We are too busy trying to be copies of what everybody else thinks we need to be instead of being the uniquely you person that God created you to be. Amen. Your cross is your personal gift from God to fulfill the purpose that he's made for you. Your purpose. But see, we want to do what we want to do. We want freedom. We want liberty. We want to do what we want to do. We don't want boundaries. We don't want to have a safe place, actually, that God can form us and work in us and through us. We want to do our own thing and be loose and free. So, but when we're loose and free, this is, Vanessa, all these strings are all loose and free. Her bow is all loose, and she's going to try to play some, some music. She's going to try to make beautiful music. Is it beautiful music? Is it? Even to the untuned ear, that's, that's not good music. <laughs> even, but wait, even with a skilled master musician, 
Beautiful music can't happen because it's unwilling to be willing. But when we tune the string, all different, all separate, they each play a different note, unique in the purpose that they've been made to be. They come together when they're stretched, when they're pulled, when they're bound. And God is working out his purposes in you to the depth and the degree that you're willing to be stretched and pressed is to the degree that God will be able to fulfill his purpose inside of you and also so it connects with somebody else's purpose. Thus, everything works together. The whole body and the gifts willing to serve and come together. The master musician, Vanessa, God, able to create beautiful music. Is that not beautiful music? Thank you so much. I wish she could stay up here and play longer, but I got too much more to say. The next point I want to talk about, if the drama team could get ready, is when we are willing to pick up our cross and follow Jesus. Scripture tells us, I got to find it so you guys have the reference here because it's very important. Hebrews 5, 8 says, Jesus learned obedience from the things he suffered. We need to understand that life happens to everybody. It does. That we're going to go through hurt. We're going to go through loss. We're going to go through some bad stuff. And sometimes it, it lasts a long time. There are seasons when they just don't seem to want to end. But the Lord says, you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. You have grace for your race, not grace for anybody else's race. Don't look to the left or to the right. It's for your race, your cross that God has given you. But in that season sometimes, it's okay if you're not okay. Because when everyone in the whole house is about the business of serving, that means no one's left out. Because when everyone is about the business of somebody else's business, no one is forgotten. No one is left out. No one will be cast away when we're all about the business of seeking somebody else's business. So when you're not okay, it's okay. Because somebody else is okay and they're going to help you be okay. You're not a safe place for everybody. But you can be a safe place for someone. Amen. We need to create that safe place. Because church, if we want to reach a lost and dying world, there's going to be lots of people in here needing to come in those doors and find a safe place of real, authentic people who know about what it's like to struggle. Let's see this drama as they illustrate this point for us. Hey guys, I, I just want, want to thank you for the ride. I'll, I'll be up and driving real soon. No problem, friend, anytime. Thanks. Yeah, we're here to help you guys out. So 
you know, if you need anything, just let us know and uh, tell Angie I said hi. Uh, okay. Oh, I totally forgot. Angie wanted to know if you got her text. Her text. text. Yeah, <laughs> about the Christmas party tonight. You know, you know the Christmas oh, festivities that and is cookies. Tonight. It's tonight. Oh my gosh, I totally forgot. You, you know you, what? Sounds like a lot of fun. Well, you guys are coming, right? Yeah. Hey, yeah. I'm Game Kim. Yeah, sure. We'll be there. Okay, okay, great. You guys were the only ones who didn't confirm. So uh, everyone's looking forward to seeing you. Oh, we'll, that's wonderful. We'll, we'll see you tonight. Okay. All right. Take All right. care. <laughs> After you, honey. Thank you, darling. <laughs> <laughs> I am so not going. Why? Just, I just can't. I just can't go out there. I, can't, I just can't put on another happy, smiley face. Everything's OK. Well, me neither. But honey, if we don't go, people are going to start asking questions. We'll let them ask questions. I don't care. They can ask all they want. We don't have to answer them. It's none of their business. Kim. Desmond, please, I'm just so not in the, oh, I'm not in the Christmas holiday mood. Me neither, but you know, we can't hide in here forever. Yes, we can. Why can't we? You and me, just, just the two of us, <laughs> right here in our own home. We don't have to go anywhere. It's okay. Please don't make me go. It, I don't want to go. I can't It's go. okay. Hey, we're in this together. Just you and me. Okay. You promise? Promise. All right. Let me get myself together one more time. Okay. Okay. You ready? Yeah, I'm ready. All right. Are you hey. going to Brad's thing? Yes, we are. Oh, We're just heading over there right now. It's huh? going to be so much fun. Yes. How have you guys been? I haven't seen you in like forever. Well, you know, it's Christmas. We're running around kind oh, of busy. Oh, yeah, for sure. <laughs> well, we're, we're really excited. I love the Christmas season. Who doesn't? I mean, everyone's in a great mood. Yes, absolutely. And everyone loves it. You see your family and your friends. You got like 80 parties. It's <laughs> the best. <laughs> Whiz, those people, oh my goodness. They're, they're like as nosy as heck. What? Ah! Oh. Well, what, what did you expect? We, we've been living like hermits. People are bound to talk. Well, they can talk. They can keep talking all they want. I am not talking. I don't care. We can't keep living like this. Yes, we can. Of course we can. Just me and you, remember? Well, I can't. Fine. Fine. Just. You can just go. You can just leave. You can just leave me alone. You don't mean that. Yes, I do. You and your stupid promises. Oh, gosh, make him go away. Just make him go away. Kim. Please make him go away. Are, are, are you guys okay? Yeah. Yeah, sure. Des, you, you, you don't sound okay. We're fine. Stop being nosy and just go away. We're fine. Kim. Look, I, I got some of your mail in my mailbox. I'll just, I'll leave it here on the front step. Y you know, guys, if, if you need anything, Ange and I are here for you. We're, we're okay. We're, we're okay. Y you know, Des, I, I don't think you are okay. But you know, it's, it's okay not, not to be okay. I think he's gone. Where are you going? You can't. It's, it's, it's not. It's not what? It's not safe. We're not OK. We need help. I know. It just hurts too much. It hurts too much. I know. I don't want to talk anymore. My sweetheart, we have to try.
was very powerful. Romans 12, 9 to 10 says, don't just pretend to love each other, really love them. Hate what is wrong, hold tightly to what is good. Love each other with genuine affection and take delight in honoring each other. Galatians 5.13 says, For you have been called to live in freedom, my brothers and sisters, but don't use your freedom to satisfy your sinful nature. Instead, use your freedom to serve one another in love. That's what it means to delight and honor each other. That we don't use our freedom actually to live for me, myself, and I, but that we use our freedom instead to serve each other, to help each other. To make sure that when we're not okay, there's a safe place. And we're saying, it's okay. No condemnation here. No judgment here. But we're here to help you. To pray for you. To lift your hands up when you can't lift up yours. If the worship team could come out. You know, we also have to really understand as Christians... We're not some, (laughs) becoming a Christian is one of the hardest things that you'll ever do in your life. It demands that you do not live for yourself, that your life is no longer your own. It requires that you are willing to be willing that you offer up your life in service to your king, to others to whomever he calls you to serve. But in the process of doing that, we have to understand that if we want to be overcomers, we have to overcome something. If we want to have a great message, there's got to be some messes that we've got to like learn to walk through and clean up with Jesus' help. If we want great faith... We have to battle and persevere through doubt. And in the midst of that, we have to believe who God says he is. But we don't get that faith without first facing that doubt. Acknowledging that it's there. God's not afraid of your questions. He's okay. He's not afraid of your doubt. He's good with that. But then when he speaks truth in your life and he shows himself to you, that's faith that rises up. Courage begins to take hold because he's proven himself to you. That we are a people who actually are the people of Jesus Christ. Will you stand with me? I want to change the way we pray. I don't want us to be asking Jesus to take away our fear. I want it. Him to, I want us to say, Lord, give me faith. Not just take away my fear, give me faith. Lord, I'm depressed. I have anxiety. Lord, instead of taking that away, Lord, give me hope. Give me the mind of Christ. Instead of praying for God to take away all these bad things, Lord, give me a heart like David to pursue you no matter what to pursue you when it's not easy to pursue you when it's hard and it hurts and I'm being squeezed and I'm being stretched and I'm being pulled and I have nothing left to give but I choose to pursue the Lord with a heart that's after him because the Lord is who he says he is he's not who you think he is But he's who he says he is because he doesn't change. He's who he says he is. And God is your defense. So no matter what the world says, you make a choice today. That you either stand with man and you will be judged by God. Or you stand with the Lord and let man judge. Because what can man do to you? If God is for you, then who can be against you? See, the only thing the enemy has today is addition and subtraction working for him. And we're going to subtract from the kingdom of darkness today. But God says, one 
puts a thousand to flight and two puts ten thousand three puts a hundred thousand can you do the multiplication this morning God says I multiply I create from nothing I can do what seems to be impossible I do it but I work through my people who choose to believe who I am would you sing with me this morning and believe in the Lord who he says he is. So give me faith like Daniel in the lion's den. Give me hope like Moses in the wilderness. Give me a heart like David. Lord, be my defense so I can face my giants with confidence. Give me faith like Daniel in the lion's den. Give me hope like Moses in the wilderness. Give me a heart like David. Lord, be my defense so I can face my giants with confidence. So give me heart like Daniel in the lion's den. I can face my giants with confidence. This morning, if you have some giants in your life today that you're saying today's the end, we're done. I'm not doing this anymore. The altar is open. Come and face your giants with the Lord because he is your confidence. Because he is your defense and he will fight for you. Come to the front as your point of contact today to surrender, to say, Lord, today I'm going to pick up my cross and follow you and I'm going to choose to face my giants today with you because you're my defense. If you're facing something today that you know, God, I need you. I can't do this without you. I need you to give me hope. I need you to give me a heart like David. I need you to give me courage. here today to break every yoke of fear and intimidation and bondage of depression and anxiety and if you want it today and you hear Jesus calling you then you stand up you step out of your seat and let courage rise up in you and let God prove himself to you let him be your defense today we're gonna sing we're gonna stand we're going to shout and we're going to shake the wall, WCF, until it all falls down and Jesus be glorified and lifted up. I want all of Windsor to hear this morning that we are here and we are ready to take our place and fight in the name of Jesus. Gonna sing and shout and shake the walls. Won't stop until I see them fall. Gonna stand up, step out when you call. Jesus, Jesus. Gonna sing and shout and shake the walls. I can't hear you, walls. WCF. Won't stop until I can't I see hear them you. Fall. Gonna stand up, step out when you call. Jesus.
together. We want to see what God has done in our hearts today. If you don't have a communion element, please get a hold of a communion element. say you are. I believe that you are the king who first came to serve me. And today, Lord God, we as a church, as a body, we come to serve the king without coercion, without duress, Lord God, become of our own volition to you, humbly giving you everything, taking up our cross today and choosing that you would fulfill your purpose, your unique purpose in each and every one of our hearts today. Thank you, God, for healing, for breaking every chain, for releasing the stronghold, breaking and shattering those, Lord God, that are lies. Father, this morning we say yes and amen to the truth, to the truth about how great, how great, how great your love is for us. How great your love is for us and that the truth is your love never fails. Your love is our hope, your love is our truth, your perfect love casts out all fear, Lord. And we thank you, Lord, that because of the blood of Jesus, you are our defense today as we receive his broken body. The cup represents his blood that was spilled for us. And there is great power in the blood of Jesus. So we declare today that fear has to go, that anxiety has to leave, that depression and discouragement is broken off of people's lives in the name of Jesus. Father, we take up our cross today and we thank you that your glory is being revealed in us and through us to the world. Help us to declare your truth to the nations. Father, today I thank you that you're working in the hearts of men and women here in this room. And it's okay to not be okay. And it's okay to walk through stuff. But we know that you're right with us and you are our mighty deliverer and your power delivers us. So Father, for freedom today, we remember the freedom that you purchased at the cross for us as we partake now in the name of Jesus.